Hello everybody, welcome back to a brand new episode of Mega Projects. This one is all about the Airbus A300, so let's jump in. Today, there are two words that are synonymous with domestic airliners, Boeing and Airbus. These two titans of the industry stand toe to toe, dwarfing all others around them, the epitome of a duopoly. It would be easy to think that it's just always been that way, that they have been feuding since day one, but that's not the case. And in today's Mega Projects video, we're going to talk about the Herculean task that it took to bring down a titan, or should I say, rather, to build a new one. Since the early 1950s, European governments have made it a bit of a habit of theirs to stick their noses and their funding into the businesses of airlines and airplane manufacturers. The three best known examples of this are the de Havilland Comet, the Concorde program, both of which we've already done videos on, and of course the topic of today's video, the Airbus A300, or simply the Airbus program. Before we get into that, though, we need to set the scene just a little bit. You see, at some point in the mid-1950s, it started becoming apparent to the nations of Europe that the entire continent was lacking in some of the most lucrative markets of the time, the airline industry, or more specifically, the airplane manufacturing industry. While it was true that most countries had airplane manufacturers, they were dwarfed by those American giants, Boeing and McDonnell Douglas, who accounted for more than 80% of the market at the time. Clearly, something had to be done if Europe were to have any reasonable part of this market. And so the European government set to work to establish ways of developing their industries with an ethos of teamwork and not wasting money. Not really. They just threw lots and lots of government money at small companies and told them, go make better planes than the Americans. The nations of Europe were convinced that the key to success was developing new and proprietary technology and then beat the Americans to market with it. This was their intention with the Comet, which was the first domestic airliner to use jet engines instead of turboprops. And they did achieve this. However, if you've already seen our video on the Comet, you'll know that it was a great idea, but the execution was pretty bad. Consequently, the Brits teamed up with the French for another swing at the Americans with the Concorde program. And again, if you've seen our video on the Concorde, you'll know that this time it was great execution, but it was a bad idea with even worse timing. So this brings us to 1966 and the release of what was called the Plowden Report. This was a report out of the UK looking into the nation's airplane manufacturing industry and by extension, the rest of Europe's manufacturing as well. One of the conclusions reached was that the market was calling for an efficient, mid-range, high-capacity jet and that this jet would need to be years ahead of what the Americans were making at the time. The report also stated that the only way to make a project of this kind feasible was to make it the combined effort of many manufacturing companies located all across Europe. This attitude of cooperation was no doubt spurred on by the establishment of the European Union just one year prior. The theory behind the A300 was that by working together, they could develop a product that no single country or manufacturer could have done alone. By spreading the task and widening the pool of minds at work, they could avoid the mistakes of the past. And after much discussion, an agreement was made between the UK, France, and West Germany at the 1969 Paris Air Show. It was decided that each country would assign manufacturers to the project. For the UK, it was Hawker Sydney. France was the two companies, Breguet and Nord Aviation, and West Germany was a conglomerated number of its top manufacturers under the name. <laughs> And Lord help me. <laughs> Arbeitsgemeinschaft Airbus, which roughly translates to working group Airbus, but let's just call it Airbus, the German language, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> Later in 1971, the Spanish joined with CASA and the Dutch with Fokker. And after all of that, the development was ready to get underway. So, we've got our multinational ragtag bands of engineers and bureaucrats ready to take on the Americans. And their first question was probably, well, where do we start? And the answer, well, that was from the beginning. This would be a brand new design from the ground up, and they were going to leave nothing to chance when it came to making the best product possible. They were going to need to innovate, and boy, did they innovate. They pioneered designs and concepts that are still the industry standard to this day. The primary one is the combination of a wide body twin jet configuration, which had never been done before. Wide body is the name given to a plane with a wide fuselage, allowing for more passengers and cargo. As you might expect, this configuration 
configuration generates a lot of drag and weight, so at the time, the design would only really be found on the long-range quadjet or trijet aircraft. These are simply aircraft with three or four jet engines attached, but the A300 would be the first time a manufacturer had only put two engines on a wide body. When implemented on the right route, so wide-body jets would have significant advantages over a narrow body, especially when using twin jets. However, it was believed that there were too many problems with such a design for it to be feasible. Some of those reasons we'll get into in a bit, but suffice it to say that one of the main objections was that two engines were thought to not be powerful or efficient enough to cover any meaningful distance. However, Airbus were able to work around this problem by building the fuselage out of composite materials instead of the conventional metal alloys. These were a fairly recent discovery, and only recently it had become cheap enough to use for commercial purposes. This would be another first for the civil aviation industry, and would bring the weight of the aircraft within the capability of two modern engines. Also, here's a quick fire list of some other pioneering advancements that were made in this design. First, to use a digital cockpit, incorporating the brand new onboard computer systems from the Concorde program, removal of the need for an in-flight engineer, further cutting costs, and the addition of a supercritical aerofoil, which is basically a kind of wing shape that promotes smooth airflow during flight, reducing a lot of drag that would normally occur at cruising speed and is not, as we initially suspected, a very judgmental plane wing. With those design choices out of the way, the next question would probably be, well, who is going to build what? And this is where Felix Krach, the director of production, comes in. With the matter-of-fact efficiency you might expect of the Germans, he decided that a job would be assigned to whoever was best at it, sensibly. This meant that the Brits handled the wings, the French were in charge of the cockpit control systems and the lower fuselage, the Germans were in charge of the upper fuselage, the Dutch handled the moving elements of the wings, and the Spanish dealt with the tailplane. This proved to be an excellent decision, as it permitted extreme attention to detail for every single part of the aircraft, and it stopped any conflicts arising due to disagreements over design specifications. And with all of that, and much, much more in mind, the development could finally go ahead, and at first it went really smoothly. No foreshadowing there at all. As we've said, their engine choice and design had to be impeccable, and at first they had decided on a custom-made Rolls-Royce engine as there was nothing on the market that could make the required power while remaining efficient. However, the execs at Airbus were not about to make the same mistakes as before and get caught out by market trends. About halfway through the engine's development process, the technical director, Roger Bettiel, was handed a report that said, according to market trends, a plane with a capacity of 300 would struggle to be sufficiently filled on regular routes. This led him to make the decision to reduce the capacity of the A300 from 300 to 250. Interestingly, the capacity is where the plane got its name from, A300. However, instead of just calling it the A250, they called it the A300B, just to be confusing, I guess. Anyway, this reduction in seating also meant that they could reduce the length of the fuselage by 5.62 meters, allowing them to bring the cabin floor up just a little bit further, making room for a larger cargo hold. This reduction cut the weight of the plane by about 25 tons, putting them within the capability of already existing engines. Two, to be precise, the General Electric CF6 and the Pratt & Whitney PW4000. Henri Ziegler, the general manager of Airbus, decided that switching to the American-made engines would help them sell the plane in America. Therefore, they opted for the Pratt & Whitney engines and cancelled the contract with Rolls-Royce. And while this may have pleased the Americans, it certainly did not amuse the British government, who promptly threw all of their toys out of the pram and said that they were pulling their funding from the project. This put British design or Hawker Sydney in a bit of a pickle. However, as they were most of the way through developing the wings, they decided that they were going to put 35 million pounds of their own money into continuing development with another 35 million loan from the West German government, which equates to roughly 1.16 billion pounds today. After three years in development, they were finally able to start building the plane, and it's here that we meet Felix Cracked again. There was one last hurdle to overcome before rolling the plane into production. This was how they were going to get a great many very expensive, very heavy, very large pieces of airplane from seven different manufacturing facilities scattered all around Europe to the final assembly plant in Toulouse. 
France. And honestly, the construction process of just one of these planes is sort of a mega project in itself. By our estimates, the plane parts had to cover a combined 6,100 kilometers, that's 3,290 miles, before they even started to be put together. What Crack decided on was a masterstroke of logistics. He decided to use a method of assembly known as just-in-time manufacturing. The process is quite common in the automotive industry. Essentially, the idea is that if you have parts coming from many different locations on many different shipments, you can organize the shipments to arrive precisely at the time they are needed for assembly, cutting down on a slew of costs and the time required to create the final product. At first, the plan was to have the parts arrive by a combination of road and rail. However, it quickly became apparent that this was just not going to work. You see, just-in-time manufacturing requires tight deadlines for deliveries, or the entire process just falls apart and well, I'm not going to point figures, I'm just going to say that I'm almost entirely certain that it was the British rail system that was causing the delays. I mean, it's not like the Germans are known for that stuff. So, in 1970, Crack decided that the best course of action was to buy a fleet of four Strato cruisers from Boeing. Maybe not the solution you were expecting, but it was for good reason, because these were not normal planes. They had been modified so as to be able to carry extra large cargo. Rechristened Super Guppies, these planes had been used by the likes of NASA to transport the Apollo and Gemini rockets in the 1960s. Brushing past the fact that these were like 30 years old at the time, they served their purpose perfectly and the assembly was running like a well-oiled machine from then on. After this, they were ready to begin selling to the public. The plane had its first test flight in October of 1972, and on the 23rd of May 1974, Air France provided the first commercial service on an A300 from Paris to London. What the team had produced was every bit as advanced as they had hoped. It was safer, more efficient, and more profitable than almost anything else on the market. With orders coming in from European airlines, it would be easy to think that the hard part was over. However, it was really only just beginning. Roger Betterly and Henri Ziegler were set the task of selling the plane to America, a far more difficult task than you might think. At the time, selling a European plane to an American was a little like trying to sell a book of patriotic Canadian poems to an American. Yes, the languages are similar, and no, Americans don't dislike Canadians, but they have their own poems, and Canadian poems are often thought to have a worse safety record than American poems. Maybe we're taking this analogy too far. Look, the Americans really liked their own and they didn't like buying anything from silly Europeans. But despite this confusing metaphor, the decision was made that an all-out marketing campaign around the Americas would be their plan of attack. So, in mid-September of 1973, an A300 fully loaded with champagne and a slightly inebriated sales team, because let's not forget this was the 1970s, set off from Toulouse across the Atlantic, spending the next six weeks landing in hub airports throughout North and South America. The tactic garnered quite a bit of media attention. Despite not having organized the plane's landing schedule to coincide with any large air shows, they still began to gather crowds wherever they went. It was being very well received, and you can imagine the team's sales pitch. Guys, they've got American engines. They're cheaper to operate, and guess what? Our designers have said it, so it's inches and miles, not meters and kilometers, because f the metric system, am I right, guys? Buy a plane! By the time the tour was over, the team were feeling pretty hungover, but also very confident that they'd managed to secure a stake in the American market, and it was only a matter of time for the orders to come rolling in. Can you see where we are going with this? This highly expensive gamble completely flopped, with Airbus failing to secure a single order. It seemed that developing something with so many advancements was going to be the undoing of the whole endeavor. Remember when we said that we'd go into reasons why you don't put two engines on a wide-body aircraft? Well, now we're going to talk about that, because, well, we keep our promises here at Mega Projects. For broken promises, you can check out my other channel, Business Plays. Anyway, back in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, the established design for an Atlantic crossing aircraft was trijet or a quadjet configuration. This was because of something called the 60-minute rule. This is similar to the 5-second rule, but instead of being a ridiculous rule about food on the ground, it is a federal law outlining the maximum amount of time that a plane can be from a suitable airport when flying over bodies of water or desolate land. So it's entirely different. The rule only applies to planes with two engines or less. The reasoning behind this is that if one of the engines on a twin jet plane were to fail midway across the Atlantic, it would only have that one engine available to limp the remaining hour and a half flight over the Atlantic to the nearest airport for an emergency landing. So let's say you tried to fly New York to London in a twin jet aircraft during the 1960s, you'd have to fly north to Canada, east to Iceland, where 
you can land and refuel and then Norway and then south to London. Needless to say, all that extra distance would make a ticket hugely expensive, not to mention time consuming. It was more profitable to simply add an extra engine and go direct. Yes, it was less efficient per mile, but it cost much less than going the other way. Airbus, however, had plans for this, and they approached the Federal Flight Administration, the FAA, requesting that they get an extension to the rule allowing them a direct Atlantic crossing. To which the FAA were like, well, no. More specifically, the head of the FAA, J. Lynn Helms, decided to get involved and said, it'll be a cold day in hell before I let twins fly long haul over water routes, which, you know, it's a fairly clear message there. However, the Airbus team persisted using the advanced safety measures on their plane to convince the FAA, and eventually they were granted ETOPS extension. ETOPS stands for Extended Range Twin Operations, also known to pilots as Engines Turn or Passengers Swim. This permitted them to fly a maximum distance of 90 minutes, 30 minutes more than before, away from the nearest airport, opening up direct Atlantic routes to the new airplane. So now we return to our little band of bureaucrats, and they're in dire straits between December of 1975 and May of 1977, as they didn't sell a single plane. That drunken sales team were now scrambling to make a sale, and there were calls to shut down the program altogether due to unprofitability. The previous general manager of Airbus had been sacked, and had been replaced by a man named Bernard Lathery, who took an aggressive approach to marketing, looking to make deals that would make even Donald Trump blush. Finally, in 1977, he managed to secure a deal with Eastern Airlines, one of America's big four airline companies. This deal effectively meant that Airbus gave them four A300s free of charge. If Eastern liked them, they had the option to buy the four planes at a discounted price. If not, well, they could just give them back free of charge, free postage included. But there was no need, because the head of Eastern, Frank Borman, was so impressed with the efficiency of the A300, which consumed 30% less fuel than even the most efficient jet in their fleet, that he not only purchased the four A300s they already had, but he ordered 23 more. After this, the other American airlines had no choice but to purchase A300s in order to remain competitive with other airlines, and by 1979, just two years later, they had received 256 orders for the A300. This is probably the ultimate example of a free trial. Following this deal, Airbus saw massive growth in the sector, and in 1987, upon the release of the A320, Airbus cemented themselves as a major player in the airplane manufacturing market, with production of this plane still ongoing to this day. But what of the A300? Well, this plane saw widespread use for many years after, and once the time came for the airlines to begin replacing the aircraft, Airbus had a huge range of new planes to choose from. The A300s, as is common with airlines, were sold off to air freight companies, where they still operate today. One interesting development on the A300 was that when the time came for Airbus to replace the Super Guppy transporters, they made the decision to turn some of their own A300s into the A300 Beluga STs. They got a few regular A300s and modified their fuselage creating a massive airplane that resembled a flying whale or beluga. They then assigned this aircraft to fly over busy fishing docks in an attempt to scare the fishermen into thinking flying whales were real. What? However, they soon realized that these modifications also made it good for transporting heavy airplane parts. Today, scaring fishermen has just become a secondary function of the A300 Beluga, although it's regularly heard lamenting the good old days. As of 2018, Boeing and Airbus are almost equal in size. However, following the release of Boeing's brand new 737 MAX, it was found that a flaw in the design of the plane was responsible for some highly publicized crashes. This resulted in every 737 MAX worldwide being grounded for 20 months while the flaws were fixed. During this time, Airbus was able to take advantage of their competitor's loss by ramping up production of the A320neo, which is Airbus direct competitor to the 737 MAX, and in 2019, Airbus pushed Boeing off the throne as the largest airplane manufacturer, outselling Boeing by about 400 planes. As for the future of air travel, everyone's got their own ideas as to what the future may hold. Some think the next stop could be space, some think it's electric planes. It's impossible to tell what the future will hold. If someone a year ago had told you how you'd end up spending 2020, would you have believed them? All you can do is take lessons from the past into the future. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below. Don't forget to subscribe. If you've got a suggestion for a future Mega Projects video, you know what to do. Use the comments, upvote the ones you like. We'll probably make those. And thank you for watching.